So I'm really happy to meet a lot of new people today. Um, and I'm really happy to work with Tim and Ethan and everybody over at UEC. This is fun and we don't get to do it as often as we would both like to. Um, so I brought out some animals with me this morning. Specifically, I brought three of our owls um, who are really fantastic at surviving weather, especially cold weather like this. Um, so we can just have a really fun conversation about all of these animals, uh, their differences, their adaptations, things that help them survive in the winter and in the night. Um, I want this to be, uh, I wanna be answering your questions. Um, so at any point, if you guys do have questions for me, uh, you can use the chat feature. I'll make sure to be monitoring that. Um, or you can turn on your camera and or uh, microphone for a minute just to ask, and then you can turn it back off um, if that makes you more comfortable. Um, what we're gonna look like today is I brought three birds with me. Uh, and so that I can take my mask off and have my voice be able to be articulated, I am I am the only person in this room. Mm -hmm. um, so that means I will we'll have to step off camera for a minute each time I go to get a bird, uh, mm -hmm. and then each time I go to put a bird away. Um, so the birds will come out one at a time, and we'll have a little pause break in between each one. Oops, sorry, I accidentally <laughs> muted you. <laughs> my bad, my bad. That's okay. Makes it easy for everybody else, right? Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll have a break in between each bird and that would be the best time to use the chat feature for your questions. Um, I will pause each time that I have a bird on my glove uh, so that you guys can ask your questions over video if you would like. Um, while each bird is out, I will tell you guys about their, uh, their natural history as a species, as well as their individual history. Um, so Schlitz Audubon has 15 birds that live with us, um, and they all serve as educational ambassadors for their species. Uh, all of the birds we currently have are native to Wisconsin, uh, and so they're really important in teaching members of the public how we can continue to protect them, how they're important to the Wisconsin ecosystem, uh, and just why they are so amazing. So, like I said, we have 15 of those birds that live here. And actually 13 of them, so most of them are raptors. Uh, so raptors all have three things in common uh, that make them really specialized hunters. So I have some things that I brought with me. The first thing that all raptors have and that we'll see in all of our birds today are talons. So this is a real talon from a great horned owl uh, that I brought with me. Uh, and you might be able to see, if I hold it up to scale, just how big this talon is. Uh, this is from a great horned owl, which is the largest owl we regularly find in Wisconsin. Uh, and so these guys are really, really huge and are able to eat a lot of huge things as well. But you'll notice, if I hold it like this, uh, that those toes are all really well articulated and they are incredibly strong and sharp. So you can kind of see that point there. Um, the strong and sharp talons that are made for gripping are one thing that is unique to raptors. Uh, so all raptors have those features on their toes and they all use their feet to actively kill prey that was alive. Um, they also have a few things on their skull that make them really specialized hunters. This is a cast of a skull of a great horned owl as well. And you'll notice that the beak is hooked over rather than pointing out. That hooked over beak is really important for tearing off pieces of flesh. Uh, now specifically, owls do like to try to catch things that they can swallow whole. So you can tell by how far back their mouth opening extends. They can extend that mouth really wide open to swallow small things. Uh, but they do use that hooked over beak to tear off pieces of large things when they need to. And finally, if I turn this this way, you will be able to see where the eyes would be in this skull. So they are at the front of the face, just like human eyes are. Uh, all raptors have those two excellent eyeballs that stick straight out forward from their face, 
uh, and this helps them use binocular vision, uh, meaning that the eyes overlap uh, and they're able to use maximum depth perception. Uh, and that's true of all really hunting animals. Uh, they all have those eyes that work together to help them see better and clearer, uh, whereas prey animals tend to have eyes on the sides of the head to see more, but not necessarily as clear. Uh, so those raptors and owls all have those three adaptations, the talons, the forward facing eyes and the hooked over beak. Uh, but within all of that umbrella that encompasses raptors, we have that smaller umbrella of owls. Um, so I wanted to kind of crowdsource here. You guys can uh, shout out or you can use the chat feature to tell me some things that all owls have in common. Uh, does anyone have any ideas right off the bat about things we see on owls? If anyone does not have practice with the chat feature that's at the bottom of your screen, the little text bubble, uh, you can use that to chat if you have any ideas. I see we have quiet flight. Absolutely, that is a feature of owls. They are nocturnal. Owls are the only raptors that are nocturnal. So there are about 400 species of raptors on earth uh, and about 225 of them are owls. They are the only nocturnal ones. Um, I see asymmetric ears. That is true of some species. We can talk about that further in a little bit. Uh, large surface of the wings. They do have large broad wings. They have pellets they have that 270 degree swivel. That's wonderful. Um, so you guys gave me a mix of physical adaptations and some behavioral ones as well, which is really wonderful. Um, so these are all true of owls. Uh, as well, when we look at an owl face, which I have, we actually have really cool heads from owls instead of a full taxidermy. This is the head of a great horned owl. And you might be able to see on the outsides, they all have this round disc on their face on both sides. Um, so this round facial disc really helps pronunciate their face. Um, so these guys are really the only ones that have a facial disc, except for the harriers, they can get a little uh, wonky to classify, but that facial disc is really characteristic of owls. So if you see a raptor that has that oval or circle shaped face, you know that's an owl. Um, so all of those things that you guys put in the chat are things we're going to talk about further um, and talk about why they're important for keeping warm, for hunting at night, all of those things. Um, now the birds that I brought are a range of sizes. Um, so I will have to stand closer or further from the camera a little bit. Uh, I'm going to start with our smallest bird first, which I hope you guys may recognize. He's kind of famous around here. Um, so I'll step off camera really quick to ask him to come out with me. Uh, if anyone has any questions right off the bat, you can put them in the chat. Um, or you can ask a question of Tim or Ethan or anyone at UEC if you'd like to uh, turn on your mic or your video. And I'll be right back. Great, everyone, feel free to uh, send a message to myself, Tim, or Maggie in a private message if you'd rather send it privately, um, or just go ahead and send it to everyone. We'd love for those questions to come in. Or if anyone has any questions for all the owls that are in my room with me right now, uh, <laughs> feel free to ask them. Where'd he go? Was he going to be big? Is he, I don't know what kind he's going to be. She's just three he's different. the largest owl. I hope it's a great horned. He might be a... Okay, I have a friend with me here. Let me kind of move my camera a little bit so you can all see him. Wonderful. So my friends, if he chooses to look at you guys here, I'll kind of orient my body so he looks up a little bit. 
This is Baron von Screech, who is an Eastern Screech Owl. Um, and you may be able to tell by the size of my glove uh, and the size of him next to my face, but he uh, is an incredibly small owl. Now, a lot of people, when I bring him out, um, they usually think he's a baby, he's going to grow. Uh, Baron von Screech is actually seven years old this year, and this is the full adult size for an Eastern Screech Owl. Uh, so he is about as tall as a soda can when standing all the way up um, and weighs just about an empty can of soda or about a stick of butter. Uh, so really incredibly small. Uh, they are not the smallest species of owl that we have in Wisconsin. There is one species smaller called the Northern Saw Wet Owl who is just a smidge tinier than they are. Um, so that really that small size helps them fit into a niche or a role in the environment uh, that is less filled by those larger predatory birds like larger owls. Um, their, their size helps them eat really specific things. So you may be able to see Baron von Screech's talons. Um, I will slowly move him closer to the camera and make sure that he stays comfortable being close to my computer, but I want you to see those tiny, tiny feet. Um, so they are those little version of the great horn talons that I showed you. Uh, and the size really dictates what they can eat. Um, so owls aim to grab prey that fits inside the grip of their talons. Uh, firstly, so that they can easily kill it, uh, but also because they want to be able to take that prey off the ground, be able to lift it into the air and into a tree so that they can eat it in a safer place. Uh, there are more predators on the ground than there are in the trees for these guys. Um, so they wanna try and take it back to their cavity or somewhere that's safer for them to eat it. Now, physically, in order for them to be able to pick something up, it has to weigh less than half of what they do. Um, so they're aiming for things that fit inside their talons and weigh less than half of their body weight. So like I said, Baron is very, very tiny. Um, half of his body weight would be about 75 grams, which is less than a quarter of a pound. Uh, so he would be aiming to catch things like worms, really small voles, uh, other insects, sometimes small snakes and things like that. Um, he's showing you his eye, really cool. Now, I'll take a pause here because I see that we've had some stuff in the chat. Um, so Baron can help me answer that. I see um, someone asked, what is the largest owl? And then someone answered, the largest owl in the world is a Blackiston's fishing owl. Uh, they do live in Russia, so we don't have them here. They're about the size of bald eagles. Um, so they're enormous owls. Uh, owls that big aren't very common. The largest owl we commonly have in Wisconsin is the Great Horned, as I mentioned. Um, but the largest owl by weight that we can have in the state is the snowy owl, which comes in at about four pounds. The largest owl by size could be the great gray owl, uh, which they can stand about three feet tall and their wings can get to up to five feet, but they are not common visitors to the state. Um, let's see, we got, they can turn their head almost all the way around. I'll go further into detail about that. Um, one lives on the Oak Leaf Trail, absolutely. Um, I'm sure that the UEC, the different um, locations have a bunch of these guys that live around. They are much more common than we think. Um, uh, I even hear them, I live in Bayview near the lake and I have heard a pair trilling together there. Um, so they are extremely widespread throughout the city and they can adapt pretty well to urban environments. Uh, they're just so small and they can camouflage so well that not a lot of people are really looking for them or can easily find them. Um, can you have owls as, as pets? Joking, not joking. Um, we actually get this question a lot because there are countries uh, where it is legal to have owls as pets. In the US, it is not. 
uh, because of the Migratory Bird Act, these guys are protected. Um, as well, I will say that even for other countries, uh, it may be legal, but it doesn't mean people should do it. Um, owls are really difficult animals to take care of. They're messy. Uh, they eat food that is messy and not always easy to come by. Uh, and their behavior is really widely uh, misunderstood. Um, so when you see people petting owls or things on the internet, those owls are not enjoying it. They are extremely upset. Um, so I see that behavior a lot and uh, I applaud our laws for not allowing people to have owls as pets. Um, why is one of Baron's eyes closed? Yeah, let me get into Baron's personal story. Um, so as I mentioned, he is seven years old this year. Uh, so he is about middle-aged for an Eastern Screech Owl. Uh, and you may notice that you are only able to see one of his yellow eyes. Uh, and he's showing it to us right now wonderfully. So Baron uh, is not winking shut the other eye. The other eye has actually been removed. Now, what happened, uh, he hatched in the wild in West Virginia. Uh, so he was a wild owl and lived with his family at one point during his life. Uh, during his first year of life, he was hit by a car in the street. Uh, and he was found by somebody who brought him into a rehabilitation center. Unfortunately, his eye had been compromised, uh, was likely in extreme pain, and a vet decided to remove it. Now, when this happens with owls, uh, we cannot ethically release them into the wild because of the way their eyes work together to hunt. Uh, so I mentioned that they have binocular vision. Uh, without the eyes being able to work together, they don't have great depth perception. Uh, and have a very decreased chance of catching prey in the wild. Um, so Baron can fly. He does know how to act like a normal Eastern Screech Owl, but he would be unlikely to be able to catch as much food as a wild Eastern Screech Owl would. Uh, so here at Schlitz Audubon, uh, we feed all of our animals prey that is already dead. Uh, mostly because most of our animals would be unable to catch it if it were live, just like Baron, uh, but also because live prey can be dangerous. Uh, live prey can fight back and hurt the predators. Uh, it's not often that that happens, but it can. So here with us, we take no chances. We feed all of our animals, including our other predators like snakes. Uh, we feed them all prey that is already dead for their safety. Now, Baron is showing us a lot of cool behaviors that I want to point out before I move to our next bird. Um, you may see he's doing it right now. When he looks at the camera and when he's listening, he bobs his head side to side. Um, he is showing that off really well right now, luckily. Um, so that bobbing the head side to side does happen with owls that have both eyes uh, and have normal sense of hearing like Baron does. When they move their head like that, uh, they can actually use their two eyes or two ears to triangulate where a sight or a sound is coming from. Uh, so by moving back and forth, they get a clearer picture of their environment. Uh, Baron is likely listening to my voice bounce off the walls in this room uh, as well. He hasn't seen this room in a while uh, because we've had a little bit of uh, decreased visitors this year. Um, so the, the virtual aspect is kind of new for our raptors. Uh, I have a question from a friend here. Where do you get the prey that you feed them? Uh, a lot of captive animals do eat uh, rodents. Uh, sometimes we feed these guys pieces of quail or uh, day old chickens, things like that. All of those are commercially available if you know where to find them. Um, there are a lot of facilities that have animals that eat things like already dead mice. Uh, for example, I have pet snakes at home, um, so I need to be able to order them from facilities. Um, we actually get our quail for our birds. It's human grade quail uh, that people can order for specialty restaurants and things like that. Uh, and then you can, we ask um, chicken farmers uh, for some small chicks from them sometimes as well. So uh, we've been able to luckily establish some relationships in Milwaukee where we can get that food for these guys. Now, 
uh, the food is a really interesting aspect of their care as well. Uh, like I said, it's, it can be very messy to feed owls. Um, we feed our birds twice a day, every single day, 365 days a year, um, and we have 15 birds. As well, uh, because Baron is small, he eats a small amount of food. Um, so he usually gets about a mouse a day, which turns out to about a dollar a day. Um, we go up in size to our bald eagles, which are the largest animals that we have here. They eat about $5 worth of rodents each and every day. Um, so our food costs are absolutely astronomical, um, which is why we love to come out and educate you guys about things like this. Um, it does not make sense for people to pay that much money for food if they were able to have these animals as pets. Um, but we also want to educate people about um, how they live here and how much it costs to take care of them. Uh, Danny, thank you for sharing a fun fact, my friend Danny. The mice and rats that UEC snakes eat come from the same place that Schlitz gets their mice and rats. Our friends Chad Ch and Chad down in Racine um, have a facility where they breed those animals for us. Uh, now I see, I want to make sure that we have time for all of our animals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put Baron away um, I'm going to come back on screen to show you guys a couple of things I'd like to hold up um, to tell you about Eastern Screech Owl so as not to frighten him. Um, and then I'll be able to grab my next bird. Uh, so at this time, if you have any further questions about Baron Von Screech or Eastern Screech Owls, you can put them in the chat uh, or you can hop on video or your microphone and ask that question. Um, either Ethan or Tim or someone from UEC can relay that to me or I'll be right next to the camera so I should be able to hear it. So now would be that time uh, and I'll be right back. Great, so go ahead and get those questions on into the chat. So maybe you can get back to those um, or Maddie. <laughs> Maddie can get back to those when she gets back. Um, that was very cute. <laughs> it's uh, interesting doing this virtually. I, I don't think I've ever seen a live owl uh, virtual. So uh, I'm glad that you all are able to be a part of this. And you know, one thing that's really interesting with owls too is, is that uh, you, you may have heard if you're, re if you're reporting an owl, uh, sometimes, it's it's good protocol not to let people know exactly where that bird is, um, particularly if it's a rare bird. Uh, sometimes what happens is somebody reports, in fact, we just got a report of a northern long-eared owl uh, and uh, at Riverside in Riverside Park. Um, and so if but if you if you post the exact location, then what happens is you get a lot of people that are come to look for that specific owl and then, uh, and then the owl gets, um, you know, there's, there's so much commotion there. It can really disrupt what the owl is doing. And, uh, so there's, there's often, you know, the, the good protocol is if you see a rare owl, you know, it's okay to say that you saw it, but you just don't want to give an exact location. Um, cause then it, it could harass them. So. Absolutely. Um, I hear of that happening a lot every single winter uh, down on the either in Lakeshore Park or near the Lake Express Ferry. There is often a snowy owl that comes to visit. Um, and so it can be really dangerous for the bird and for people to be coming close to that owl to share that information. So um, I have some stuff I wanted to show you guys, and then I'll answer some more questions that I see coming in here. Um, Baron, you saw, was a really wonderfully gray owl, and screech owls actually do come in two different colors. Um, so I have two wings from eastern screech owls to show you that contrast. Um, so the lower wing would be more similar to Baron's, which is gray, and the upper wing uh, is actually like a cinnamon red color. Um, so we call this a red morph and a gray morph eastern screech owl. Uh, and interestingly, in the last couple of years, we've had more research about the size of, or excuse me, the color of those guys changing with their distribution in the country. Um, it is thought that there are more eastern screech owls that are gray in the northern and eastern part of the country because we have more gray trees here. Uh, and then as you start to get into the southeast, there are more red. 
Um, as well, it is speculated but not proven that the gray owls um, have more chances of su surviving the winter up here because the gray absorbs a little more heat from the sun during the winter time. Um, so that's really cool. I also have, I found in my box, the wing of a northern sawwet owl. Um, so I thought I would compare those sizes just to show you how those birds are even smaller. Um, so you can see it doesn't quite extend quite as long. Um, so those birds are really like mini flying soda cans. Um, let's see, I see, is Baron von Screech still nocturnal? Yes. Um, our owls still have the opportunity to uh, be more active at night and they usually do make good on that. Um, however, our building uh, where the animals are taken care of is occupied during normal work hours. Um, and so the owls tend to wake up during that time in order to kind of keep an eye on us uh, because there's commotion. Uh, and then we leave every day at four o'clock allowing them that all that time to catch up on some sleep uh, and then also do their normal nocturnal behaviors. Do they sleep with their eyes open? They do not. Um, Baron will actually close his eye when he's ready to sleep and that aids them in the wild because uh, the color of those irises is that yellowish color um, and that can help them, it's kind of like anti-camouflage. Um, if the eye is open, it can actually kind of blare their location. Um, so if they close their eye, they actually have better camouflage against the trees. Are any of our birds able to meet? All of our birds do stay in separate enclosures. Um, raptors in the wild are not social animals except during the mating season. So the vast majority of the time, they prefer to be alone. That is their default uh, and it's healthier for them to do so. Um, so all of our birds have their own space. They can often see each other as we walk by with those animals and they can hear each other if they choose to vocalize, uh, but otherwise they like to be by themselves. Um, camouflage and screech owls. Thank you for bringing that up because that's the other thing I wanted to show you. Uh, we do have a screech owl that tends to live at Schlitz Audubon near our building. Um, and like Tim said, for those reasons, I'm not gonna share exactly where it likes to perch. Uh, we have lots on our property, but there's one that always comes pretty close to the human buildings. Um, and so I got, or a friend of mine got this picture from my office window, uh, which really shows well the camouflage of that bird. Um, People don't see him unless he's pointed out to you, which is really fantastic. So uh, those cavities are perfect spots for our Eastern screech owls. And as you can see, he blends in really well with the gray, uh, I believe that's an ash tree that he is in. Um, so that visitor is really, really special to Schlitz Audubon. Uh, there was a red one living outside a friend's apartment. We do have red ones in Wisconsin, um, gosh. If I can remember the statistic, I believe only about 15% of Eastern screech owls in Wisconsin are that fully red morph. Um, so they are rarer, but they are here. So that's really special that you got to see one. Owls, oh, a book about the blackest since fish owl. I'm gonna bookmark that for later. And yes, Northern solid owls are that like the mini version of the can of soda. They can weigh less than a hundred grams, um, which is like a fifth of a pound, which is absolutely amazing. Um, so at this time, I am going to go get our next bird. This bird is really special. Um, she, uh, she chooses to be a little bit more picky with her trainers. Um, and she tends to do better with smaller groups rather than larger groups. Uh, so a virtual group is perfect for her. Um, I also brought food with me to try and feed her. So we'll see if she'll be willing to do that for us. Uh, so I'll step off screen for a minute and I will go get her.
Okay, looking for this chat. Here's a, here's a. Oh, let me see. Yeah. Cool. Oh, that was just like a couple weeks ago. Oh, that's awesome. So that was a that was a Chad the Nature Dad episode looking at holes and trees. That was down in Bayview. So thanks for that, Chad. Ah, cool. All right, let me move this window out of the way here. Wonderful. So I'll take a step back so you can all see her up close. Uh, this is Athena, who is a common barn owl, an American barn owl. Um, and as you can see, she is much, much larger than Baron von Screech is. Uh, she is also showing off that head bobbing behavior that Baron was. Uh, this is really pronounced in barn owls and you can kind of see it a little better because of their, uh, their pronounced face and their different body shape. Um, so barn owls are in a completely different family than Eastern Screech Owls are. Uh, their owls are divided into two groups, which are the, the true owls and then the barn type owls. Um, and so within that group, the barn owls is this particular species, which is the barn owl. And there are 36 subspecies around the world. Um, so Athena is an American barn owl and they are the largest subspecies in the world. Um, and as well, Athena is a female. Now in the raptor world and most of the time in the bird world as well, females are larger because they need more body power in order to carry eggs inside their bodies. Uh, so Athena, I'm constantly surprised by her. She is an absolutely enormous barn owl. You will likely not see a barn owl of this size anywhere else. Uh, because she's an American subspecies and because she's a female. Uh, so many around the world are much smaller than her uh, and males of her subspecies are smaller as well. Uh, as well, um, they are just striking in so many different ways. I'm going to turn her around so you can see the coloration on her back. Now, Athena is a particularly dark barn owl. Uh, she has all that sooty coloration. Uh, and her chest is kind of like a tannish reddish tint. Uh, many barn owls, especially the European barn owls are much whiter. Uh, and that happens to be because of where they tend to live. Um, so in the Americas, uh, these guys are kind of hunting in grassland type areas. Um, so those colors on her body are blending in with dry grasses. Uh, and then in Europe, their grasses are kind of like a little different color and they can hunt in places with more flowering plants that tend to be white. Um, so they come in varying shades of white to tan to red all around the world. She's still head bobbing, which is absolutely amazing. Um, they have that really pronounced facial disc. And here is where I'd like to talk about their ears uh, and the neck flexibility that she's showing us. Uh, so barn owls are a species of owl that has asymmetrical ear openings. Uh, and what I mean by that is that in their skull, uh, it's actually positioned so that one ear is down low and then one ear is up high. Um, the sound waves that are coming into their ears then reach at a different time so they can more easily pinpoint where that sound is coming from. Uh, not all owls have asymmetrical ear openings. Uh, that's a common myth that's out there. Barn owls do. Uh, and in fact, barn owls have been tested many times uh, and they have the best hearing of any animal that has been tested so far. Um, I'm going to see if she is willing to eat for us. So let's see if she is. There she goes. So she's got a mouse tail in her head right now. She's going to swallow that so you guys can see what that looks like. The tail going down is usually pretty cool. Awesome. <laughs> um, so that facial disc, that really pronounced white heart on her face is helping funnel sound into her ears as well. Uh, those feathers are really, really rigid. Um, so it kind of acts like one big satellite dish that's helping her listen. Um, so she has a really fantastic sense of hearing. And in fact, in our training with her as well, we do use sound cues. Um, so she is in training to fly for public programming and she does 
um, at certain seasons of the year. Um, so we can use sound cues to help guide her to where we would like her to go. Um, let's see, I might be able to show you her feet if she's willing to let me get closer to the camera uh, after she eats that food. Wonderful swallow. I'm gonna try and get those feet a little closer. Now, these feet uh, do have some feathers on them, but they are not nearly as feathered as those of the true owls uh, because barn owls tend not to stay all year round in places that are as cold as true owls do. So barn owls are a native species to Wisconsin. Uh, at the time that they lived here, they were considered to be migratory. So they would only really be up here in the summer to breed. Um, according to the Wisconsin DNR, this species is now extirpated from Wisconsin, meaning that we are in their normal native range, but they are no longer coming here to breed. Uh, there was one sighted in the summer of 2020. Someone saw a barn owl in Wisconsin, but there was no confirmation that there was a nest here. Now, the reasons for that are really, really sad. Um, for a long time, you know, we had abandoned buildings like barns across the state um, or even barns that weren't abandoned. And that was perfect habitat for these guys as they like to be in enclosed spaces like cavities. Um, now, as we kind of move forward into the more modern farming age, uh, we are tearing those old buildings down and providing less habitat for them. They can also live in trees with cavities. Um, but people are chopping down more trees, choosing less habitat for these guys. Uh, as well, barn owls are incredibly susceptible to rodenticide poisoning. Um, so we recommend that no one use any form of rodenticide for rodent control uh, because rodents are really uh, building up a tolerance to poisons like that. So it doesn't kill them right away. Uh, in fact, when people use mouse poison, uh, it usually doesn't kill that rodent for three days. And in the meantime, it only slows down the rodent enough for a raptor or another animal to catch it, where then these animals die an extremely painful death. Um, so because of habitat loss, because of rodenticides, Wisconsin has lost our barn owls. Uh, we are hoping that we can bring them back at some point in the future. And that's actually how Athena came to us and why she helps. Um, she came as a captive bred bird from the World Bird Sanctuary in St. Louis. So she has never lived in the wild. Um, and the World Bird Sanctuary has a two-pronged approach to how we can bring barn owls back to the Midwest. Uh, they do have a breeding program there where they produce many different barn owls each year. Uh, and then of that group that they're able to produce, some of them are released and some of them are sent to educational facilities like ours. Um, if all of the owls were released, we would continue having the same problems. But if Athena is able to inspire people, like she's doing right now, um, if she's able to inspire people to help and educate people about why barn owls are dying in Wisconsin, uh, then from releasing them and from educating, we actually have a hope of saving them. Um, luckily, barn owls are spread all across the world. They are on six continents everywhere except Antarctica. Uh, so we are in no danger of losing the species as a whole, but the Midwest is in danger of losing our American barn owls in this part of the country. Now I see our friends Leopold and Wiley have two questions. They said, are some owls picky? And then why are they called barn owls? So some owls are picky. All animals are individuals. And with our raptors, we spend so much time with them that we are able to learn about their individual nature. Um, for example, uh, Athena knows me very, very well. And I have known her since she was just a fluffy baby chick when she came to live here. Um, so she luckily has chosen to trust me. However, she uh, does not give that trust lightly to other people. And so when she's introduced to new trainers, she doesn't always choose to show comfortable behaviors with them as often. Um, as well, you guys kind of saw, you might have asked this question because she's choosing not to eat much food. So she is picky about the food she eats sometimes as well. Her favorite is mouse, um, which is what I brought. These are pieces of mice. Um, but today she is choosing not to eat it and that's okay. 
there's nothing I can do to make her eat. So we just let her choose what she wants to do. Um, do I have any other questions about Athena or barn owls before she goes away? Just kind of repositioning here. Um, above me in this room, there are rafters on the ceiling. Uh, and sometimes uh, during her flight season, she comes to flight train in here. So she's looking at the rafters to see if she wants to go up there, but she's gonna stay with me. Um, any questions about her? I don't see any in the chat. Does anyone wanna pop on and ask a question with video? Well, wonderful. Um, is it correct that they help control the rodent population? Absolutely, they do. Um, in fact, there was a presentation um, by Project Snowstorm, which is historically a snowy owl organization. Uh, they got a researcher from Israel who used barn owls to control rodent populations in agricultural areas, um, which is really interesting. Now here, uh, especially in California, barn owls are used to control rodent populations in winery, um, winery areas. Uh, a family of barn owls can eat up to a thousand mice in a year, likely more than that. Um, so without our owls, without our raptors, we would be absolutely overrun by rodents. So we're very thankful to have them. When is flight season? Um, flight season for most of our birds is during the summertime. So we are actively using positive reinforcement training uh, during the summers to get our birds into the air. Uh, we have one bird who has graduated from flight school, meaning we can take their leash off and fly them over people's heads. Um, and then we have three birds who are in flight school to be able to do that same thing. Uh, so this summer we'll get them back into shape uh, and where they can fly for public programming. Uh, and then another question, oh, I didn't even ask, I didn't even tell you how old she is. Um, Athena this spring will be four years old. Her hatch date is in April. Um, so she is still a very young bird. Barn owls in the wild, usually don't make it to see one year old. Um, barn owls are not a very lo long lived species. Even the longest ones really only make it to like five years old. They can make it to 10 if they're incredibly lucky. The vast majority of them die in their first year because of habitat loss and rodenticide poisoning. Uh, luckily in captivity, we can really protect them from a lot of different things that can harm them. Uh, so Athena could live to be 15, maybe 20 years old in captivity. So she's gonna be with us a long, long time. Now I'm gonna pop her back in her crate. Uh, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about that head rotation that I mentioned, and then I'll bring out our last bird for us. So I don't keep you guys too far past 10 o'clock. I'll be right back. Talking about that. Uh, barn owls. There was a, a barn owl sighting, confirmed sighting in, in northern Minnesota actually earlier this year. Um, sadly, it passed away shortly after it was, it was seen, but uh, they, are, they are not seen very much around the, the Wisconsin and Minnesota. Something we want to change for sure. Mm -hmm. um, now, to talk a little bit about the head rotation, I brought a different owl who is my friend Radar. Radar is not a real owl. So Radar is able to spin their head totally 360 degrees and continue doing that. Kind of like that snowy owl in that Wendy's commercial, uh, which I don't like because it's not true. Um, lots of people are taught that owls can just continue to do this by cartoons and things. But uh, as we like to say here, if an owl turned their head all the way around, they could only do it once. Um, so barn owls and other owls have 14 bones in their neck called cervical vertebrae uh, that help them be incredibly flexible. So they can go 270 degrees, but then they do have to turn back to the front again. So if an owl is facing front, 270 degrees is to their shoulder, all the way directly behind them with their beak over their spine like this and then all the way to the next shoulder, but they cannot complete the rotation. They have to come back around to the front. Now, where people get confused is that they can do 270 degrees in both directions. 
Um, so if they go from 270 in one direction to 270 in the other, it does look like they're spinning their head in circles, um, but they are limited by the capacities of biology. Uh, so our last bird is our biggest bird that I brought with me today. Um, so I will ask him to come out with me and then I'll take a little step back in front of the camera so you're all able to see uh, just how large he is. I'll be right back. That just blew my mind. The whole, like two, I always think of 270 degrees as like, that's it. But just the thought that if they go from one extreme to the other extreme, that's 540 degrees. Am I doing that right? <laughs> but that's crazy. That's like almost two complete circles. Whoa. It's blowing my mind too, Timmy. I really want to find this Wendy's commercial of that uh, snowy owl head rotating continually. <laughs> hmm. Oh, Rob. All right, <laughs> here is our last big bird who is choosing to sit backwards right now. We'll see, there he goes. I love the owl puns. <laughs> Um, now this bird here is Perseus, uh, who you may recognize as a barred owl, uh, a very common species here in Wisconsin and one of our medium sized birds. Um, so this owl is pretty large. Um, Perseus is a heavy barred owl, uh, but our great horns are much, much bigger than him. Now I brought food with me as well to see if he will eat it. Um, he doesn't see computers very much. Um, so this is one of our, his first virtual programs. So we'll cut him some slack if he's not willing to eat today. There we go. Now I brought mouse for him as well. Uh, mouse is, tends to be what Perseus gets every day. And then he, sometimes he gets little pieces of rat, um, which is similar to what barred owls would be eating in the wild, plenty of rodents. Uh, but as well, barred owls are kind of special in that in Wisconsin, um, they tend to live near waterways or areas that are wet. Um, so you're most likely to find barred owls near marshes, small streams and rivers, things like that. Um, and that means that they can eat interesting things as well. Um, so barred owls have been seen fishing before for live fish. Um, we know from finding their pellets that things like frogs, salamanders, and crayfish are regular staples in their diets. Uh, and they can eat larger insects as well, like grasshoppers, which is really, really cool. Um, I'll see if he'll let me get his feet a little closer to the camera so you can see just how fuzzy they are. Um, you can kind of see it on this one over here. Um, with these owls, he belongs to the true owl family. Um, and so they do have feathers down to their toes to keep them warm at night, um, as well to kind of muffle the sound when they're flying through the air. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys a barred owl wing so I can really get up close with those eyelashes. We can talk about the silent flight that we mentioned. Um, but barred owls, they are named, a lot of people think they're named um, B-A-R-D after Shakespeare, uh, but they are covered in bars for exceptional camouflage. So you can see on his stomach, he has vertical bars. Uh, his chest turns into horizontal bars. Um, and then on his wings and tail as well is that horizontal barring that really helps them blend in with the gray trees that we have around here. Let's see if he'd be willing to eat another piece for us. There we go. That one's a mouse head. So those are the yummiest bits. Um, now I wanted to point out as well about their eyes. Um, barn owls and barred owls, uh, the last two species we've seen, have those really dark colored eyes. Um, their irises are not black, they're an incredibly dark brown, um, but it's hard to see unless you're in direct sunlight. And then Baron von Screech, the first owl we saw, had yellow irises. Um, so that has to do with differences in their genetic lines, of course, um, but it can kind of tell us a little bit about when the owls are most active. Um, so the owls in Wisconsin, the most common ones that have yellow eyes are eastern screech owls, northern saw-wet owls, and great horned owls. 
Um, so all of those yellow-eyed owls also tend to be crepuscular animals. And crepuscular animals are ones that are, tend to be more awake at dawn and dusk time. Um, so other crepuscular animals are things like coyotes and deer. Uh, so owls with yellow eyes tend to be more active when the sky is yellow, sunrise and sunset. And then our barred owls uh, and our barn owls have darker eyes as well. Those owls tend to be more active in the true dark of night. So they have dark eyes, they're awake at the dark of night around two or three o'clock in the morning. And as well, whenever I hear barred owl calls, it is usually in the deepest part of the night as well. Let's try another piece of food here. So another cool thing about barred owls, now you can't see this on Perseus because he's lived with us for so long, but as I mentioned, barred owls do eat some animals that tend to live near waterways and they can actually change the color of their feathers depending on their diets. Um, so you may have heard before that uh, animals like male cardinals, um, their color can change slightly depending on what they're eating. Uh, so they can get brighter red if they eat more things with carotenoids. Uh, these guys, the white in their feathers can actually become pink like flamingos if they're eating a lot of animals like crustaceans, um, like flamingos eat uh, because of the the things that are in the exoskeletons of those animals. Um, so once in a while, you may be able to see a barred owl living near a waterway uh, that has a pinkish tone in their feathers that likely means that they're eating a lot of things like crayfish, um, which is really cool. I have seen that before in some of Wisconsin's owls. Um, so next time you're looking for them, you can look for something like that. Now, Perseus is our youngest bird here at Schlitz Audubon this spring he will be three years old. Uh, and he is a local owl as well. He was hatched in Madison. Um, now, unfortunately, he has a pretty sad and preventable story. Um, he, he was in his nest in Madison area. Unfortunately, his parents chose to put their nest in a public park. Um, and so when Perseus was a few weeks old and started growing in his first flight feathers, uh, he likely was trying to learn to fly. Uh, and what happened, as happens with many different owls, is that they land on the ground um, or they crash land during their first flights. This is completely normal. Um, and what they can actually do when this happens is they can use the talons to climb the tree back into their nest and try again. Unfortunately, because he was in public, uh, people did not listen to local authorities and people began to pet him, uh, take pictures with him, poke him with sticks, uh, and just in general be way too close to him and bother him a lot. Um, now, what happened because of that is two things. Uh, usually, if an owlet is on the ground, the parents will continue to feed them on the ground until the owlet can make it back into the tree. Because people were around, uh, the parents were terrified. Uh, they stopped feeding him and they actually abandoned their nest. They did not come back for him. Um, as well, Perseus began to associate himself as belonging in pre the presence of humans because humans were around him so often when he was at such a young, impressionable age. Um, so he was starving and dehydrated because his parents left him. Uh, and he got way too used to people being around. Um, when an animal is that young, it's called imprinting. So they associate themselves with people and they don't learn the skills they need from their parents. So Perseus is an imprinted owl. He is flighted. Um, he does not know how to act like a wild owl and does not know how to hunt. Now, because of that, um, it does make him a fantastic educator because he's incredibly used to the presence of lots of humans. Excuse me. Let him get situated. Um, so he's very used to people, but he would not make a good candidate to ever be released into the wild. So he will always live here with us. Um, like I said, he is three years old. Barred owls can live up to 10-ish in the wild uh, if they're lucky. 
Uh, and so they can live a little past 20 um, in captivity. Our last barred owl, you may remember Orion, on, uh, passed away a few months ago. Uh, he was 23 or 24 years old. So we're hoping that Perseus is with us for another 20 years. Um, no, let's see, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Are all owls capable of capturing prey hidden by snow cover? Uh, many of them are, and in fact, barred owls are in Wisconsin year round through the winter. Um, so they don't have asymmetrical ear openings, but they do still have fantastic hearing. Um, so they can absolutely capture animals that are hidden under the snow. Um, the owls that live in places with snow cover during the winter do have that capability. And then do they dive into the water? Uh, barred owls, in the instances that they've been caught fishing, they are fishing from the shore. Um, I haven't heard of an instance of this species diving into the water to catch food. Um, now, I wanted to mention as well, because Perseus um, is an owl species that would live in Wisconsin year round. He does usually live outdoors um, in an outdoor enclosure, as do our other bird species that usually live in Wisconsin year round. Um, it has been so incredibly cold that our birds actually have moved inside to specialized indoor enclosures to keep them safe. Um, so last Last Friday, um, right before the day that was supposed to get to negative 30 overnight, um, we did bring them inside. And for their safety of their lungs, they cannot go back outside until it's closer to freezing, about like 25 degrees. The reason for that is because it's warmer indoors where we keep them. It also means it's much more humid. Um, so if we were to move them from inside straight back out to outside, they would go from a really humid place to a really dry place. Um, so we need to protect their lungs. Our birds won't be able to go back outside until next Friday, unfortunately. Um, so they do have all of those adaptations to keep them warm for silent flight to help them survive and hunt prey in the wild. Um, but when it gets below negative 15 is when we bring our birds in just for extra safety. Um, do I have any questions about Perseus? I wanna show you guys one more thing after he's off my glove, but I can answer any more questions that we may have right now. Give everybody a second to type in the chat if they would like. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put Perseus back in his travel crate. I'll show you guys one more thing and then I can do uh, any last questions. This is also just a reminder that uh, next week's topic, Ethan will be talking about eruptions. And, and when you think of snowy owls in Wisconsin, uh, that's a, a good, good poster uh, bird for eruptions. They're not the only ones that do it, but uh, these kind of irregular movements based on patterns. So uh, join us next week, Friday for that one. And um, I'm just, this is so amazing to me. I'm just blown away by all of this. I'm, I thought I knew a lot about owls, but. <laughs> uh, I love talking about them. I could keep going, but I'm not gonna keep you guys. Um, I want to show you that silent flight adaptation that someone mentioned earlier. Um, so the birds all on the leading edge of their wing, um, the leading edge would be the edge that is pointed forwards when they're in flight. They all have kind of like an eyelash groove. So let me see if I can get that. You can kind of see how there are rough edges on the leading edge of those wings. Uh, and that helps ruffle the air as it travels over the wings, which makes less noise. Now, owls and uh, rodents are in an evolutionary arms race, uh, which is why rodents have such big ears. They have adapted to try and listen for things who are hunting them so that they can get away. And owls over time have become quieter and quieter in their flight to try and sneak up on them, which is really, really cool. Um, I have a question here. Are there any predators of owls when they are adults 
If not, is the limiting factor territory or habitat? Um, so there, it depends on the owl species. Um, our Eastern screech owls, that first species I showed you, they do have predators when they are their adult size because they're still so small. Um, they do get preyed upon by larger owls, specifically great horned owls are extremely menacing um, and are not picky when it comes to what they eat. So great horned owls will eat um, all of the other species of owls here in Wisconsin if they can get to them. Uh, when they are babies, all owls are subject to uh, nest raids by crows, ravens, raccoons, uh, sometimes snakes in certain areas, not really in Wisconsin, but um, those eggs and the babies are most in danger. Uh, is the limiting factor territory and habitat? Uh, it, depending on the species as well, um, some owls can be more territorial than others. Uh, the space is definitely an issue uh, and food can be an issue as well. Luckily, our owls don't uh, compete for food with hawks because they're awake at different times of day, hunting different types of animals. Um, but yeah, those guys are really well adapted to kind of fitting into their own little spots so that they don't have to deal with each other too much. Um, what else can I answer for you guys? As I said, I love talking about owls, but I have kept you past the time I promised. Um, so any last questions about any of our owls, the Schlitz Audubon Raptor program, uh, anything else that piques your interest? Well, then I did my job, it seems like. But what's uh, what's the one uh, what's one takeaway that you would uh, you would hope uh, everybody that was watching today um, goes home with? What's like one of the most important things for people to know? Sure, that's a great question. Um, usually, for all of our animals, it's to kind of instill a sense of wonder. Um, when when people care about things, when people meet an individual animal, they're more likely to care about it, more likely to do something to help it. Um, now, what I have found is that with owls, they really don't need our help in being inspiring um, because people are constantly amazed by owls. People love owls, think they're absolutely magical, which they are, um, but owls need our help. Um, I, I think I talked with every single owl species about um, how they're losing their habitat, how they're being poisoned. These are all things that we can do. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that UEC has um, access to nest box plans. Schlitz Audubon does as well. Um, if you want to help, there are things you can do. You can uh, refuse to put any sort of poisons or rodenticides in your spaces like your yards. Um, and as well, you can build nest boxes and either put them in your yard or put them somewhere else you think might be a great place for owls to live. Um, so I hope that for everybody, even if it's just telling your friends about how cool owls are, there are things we can do to help. Um, I see a few tiny questions and some wonderful comments. Thank you all so much. Um, a friend Karen says, is the owl enclosure visible from outside? Uh, our birds are in a private facility um, so that they have the chance to be away from human commotion when they're done programming. Um, so that facility is private, not available for public viewing, but we do have an enclosure in front of our nature center where a raptor often goes. It's usually Skywalker, our red-tailed hawk. Um, that's not occupied at this time because the viewing area in front of the enclosure is not six feet wide. We don't want to ask anyone to be um, too close to strangers in that area, but hopefully sometime this year that enclosure in front of our center will be occupied with a raptor so that you can see them. As well, our raptors, um, starting in the spring when it's warm enough, will be out every weekend from one to two. Um, it's called Word with a Bird, and if you come visit, you'll hopefully be able to see a different bird each time. Uh, why are they called the wise old owls? Um, if I can word this nicely to owls. Um, owls are not any more intelligent than <laughs> any other raptor species. Um, people, uh, they, they have been subject to a lot of myths, like... Um, 
which is why we named Athena Athena because owls were said to be her guide and she was the goddess of wisdom. Um, lots of old stories make us think that owls are wise. Owls are no crows, Tim. Um, they are, they know enough to get by. I'll say that. Why are they called barn owls? Um, well, the barn owls have existed before barns. Uh, I just don't think they were named before they were found living in barns. Um, so that is historically a place where they, were, where they had been found most often. Uh, and then lastly, I see that when I was a child, we raised a great horned owl in rehab for the Humane Society. He clicked his bill and I was told that I was scaring him. Is that an alert or alarm call? Yes, absolutely. When owls clack their beak together, that is a, a very, that is a strongly worded four letter word. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of things that owls can do to say, please leave me alone. Please give me my space. The clicking the bill is one of them. If you ever see an owl and it is doing that uh, facing you, please take a step away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I absolutely loved speaking for you guys today. I would love to see more of your faces visit Schlitz Audubon, and I can't wait to be back at UEC, hopefully sometime this year. Um, I'm always available for questions or comments or concerns. Um, so thank you all for letting me keep you and talk my ears off about owls.